questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll have plenty of time at the end. Uh, this is, um, if I recall from my conversation with Jackie, this is a bit participatory. Um, so pay attention. There may be times when you will need to participate. So I wanna welcome Jackie Armstrong here. Jackie and I have known each other uh, peripherally for many years when I lived in North Central Iowa in Mason City. I, I think one of our first intersections was we both have a fondness for native prairie in Iowa, uh, but she's long been a conservationist um, and environmentalist. So this, uh, when she gave me a call and said, I'm doing this thing called NROADS, I thought, wow, this is pretty awesome. I uh, went to her house, sat down and went through the program and ah, then it was even more awesome. So I'm really looking forward to seeing your reaction to this tonight because I think it's a pretty dynamic uh, teaching tool. Jackie, welcome to the Upper Mississippi River region and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen, for having me. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank all of you for listening to me. I am so excited to share En-ROADS with you guys. I've been, do I've been involved with it for quite some time. Um, I got involved with prairie and, and the environment after I retired from practicing law. Um, and I, went, I just realized I, there was so much I didn't know about science. And so I went back to school at the University of Northern Iowa and learned a lot about science and in the process got very passionate about the environment. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, what we're going to do tonight is uh, go through several things. First, I want to tell you a little bit about my perspective in communicating about the environment and environmental solutions. Next, I'm going to just briefly go through the climate crisis. This is a very well-educated group of people. I know you know a lot of that information already, so I'll go through that fairly quickly. But then we're going to jump into the En-ROAD simulator, which is why we're all here tonight. So I, a few summers ago, was rolling along the trail alongside the Cedar River where I live. And I noticed this just stunning damselfly. Um, these ebony jewel wings are uh, truly spectacular. And um, I was admiring it and I, uh, my little grandson at the time who was two years old called them dam flies. So as I went a little further down the trail, I noticed a mating pair. Can you believe it? They form a heart when they mate. Less romantic entomologists call it a wheel, but I think it's just really stunning. And I was so excited and um, impressed with the beauty of nature. But a, a few days after that, I was cleaning up our riverfront. There were massive slabs of limestone that were filled with silt and mud from the river. And I was cleaning it off to get ready for a, a kayaking party with some friends. And I noticed that my efforts to be tidy were wrecking havoc with these damselfly families because they lay their eggs in fresh water and they were flitting around frantically as I was sweeping off my limestone. And it just struck me deeply that no matter what we do, we have an impact on our planet and on the world. And, and often, although we're well-intentioned, we have negative impacts. And sometimes it's just the best we can do to keep learning, keep understanding the impacts we have, and move forward. And I think um, I think that's so important to keep in mind because so often when we talk about the environment and we communicate about environmental problems, it takes on a preachy tone. Have you ever felt that when you're when you're chatting with your relatives or your friends? There's this scolding tone of voice that comes across, and it's counterproductive and it doesn't motivate people to change. So I try to keep that humility in mind with my experience with the damselflies and that I too have a negative impact on the planet. And the best we can do is just um, really strive to kind of meet the goals of the League of Women, Women Voters, which is to increase all the public's understanding of environmental issues and influence policy through nonpartisan policy education and advocacy. So En-ROADS I think does just that. You can decide for yourself as we get further into this discussion. So reviewing the situation that we've got before us, this is a chart, a familiar one to you probably from um, NASA that shows our increasing concentrations of CO2 on the planet since 2005. Uh, in December of 2021, just last month, uh, two months ago, it was 417.41. So it's just going up fairly steadily. 
And um, this one shows how dramatic that increase has been for 800,000 years. The first chart was a direct measurement of CO2 concentrations, this hockey stick chart. Um, I hope you can all see that right-hand side. I have to move my Zoom pictures to see the full screen, but that sharp increase right here um, is a dramatic call to action for all of us because that CO2 concentration is higher than it's been the last 800,000 years based on indirect measurements from ice cores. Um, where are those CO2 emissions? We actually know where they're coming from. Largely fossil fuels. We've got coal in brown, oil in black, natural gas in blue with the lion's share of our CO2 emissions. And then land use changes, as you can see over the years since the industrial revolution, have not, their contributions have not changed that much. And in fact, arguably they're just slightly lower now than they, would, they were years ago. So um, the big contributors are the fossil fuels. All that's costing us a lot of money. Um, in um, the two years from 2016 to 2018, it's estimated that it cost us 54 trillion, excuse me, $650 billion between 2016 and 2018, those two years. Morgan Stanley made that estimate. But the point is pretty obvious to anybody who's paying attention to the disasters around the world. This is costing us money. It's expensive to clean up these extreme weather events. Um, and the opinions of people about climate change are steadily changing. Um, the Yale climate opinion maps, and I think uh, Gretchen's gonna put a link to those maps in the chat for you. But, in, and they're really fun maps because you can go right to your county and see what people think about climate in your county. But for this group, I just took their numbers for the entire country of the United States and 72% of Americans believe that global warming is happening and believe that it's gonna harm plants and animals in future generations. 71% believe about the harm to future generations. So that's a lot of people, 72% and 71%. And yet here is the statistic that is just so puzzling. 64% of people in our country rarely or never talk about climate change. And that's exactly why I'm here um, talking and why I hope you all are talking about it because talking about it is is an important step for driving the creation of political will to make changes. There's a way to talk about climate change that is not going to make people grit their teeth when they see you coming. I think that way is inroads. I just think it's a, it's just a friendly, nonpartisan, nonpolitical way to talk about climate change. It was developed by two groups. Um, MIT Sloan and Climate Interactive and the Sustainability Initiative within MIT Sloan. And um, it was developed for um, situations like this to just communicate about climate change. It, um, it's a simulator and I'd like to talk about why I've got confidence in this one. There's lots of climate simulators out there, many of them. It's an integrated assessment model, an IAM. And I've got confidence in this one because it's transparent. You can look up every basis for every point they make in this simulator. So if you're thinking, gee, I don't know about the economic impacts. I think I wanna change those assumptions. You can go into their model and I'll show you how to do it and change the assumptions so that you can work with the simulator as if it's a massive, a massive library at your fingertips or a massive computer database at your fingertips so you can read the studies underlying every issue that you're interested in. It's really quite wonderfully accessible by everyone. It's also, it gives me confidence to use this one because it's been tested against other IAMs and it's found to hold up pretty well. The Wall Street Journal this morning had an article about the uncertainty of integrated assessment models. I don't know if any of you caught it, um, but it's true. These integrated assessment models are filled with uncertainties because they're trying to project 
the future, which is hard to do. But they're doing it with science-based data and they all come out a little different. So if you imagine um, a graph like this and my fingers represent the different IAM projections, n Rhodes comes in here, which is just kind of a, you know, a, a nice moderate approach for trying to understand what's going to happen, not an extremist approach, but a, a moderate approach. It was based on the socioeconomic pathway Two, if you're familiar with that, there are five pathways um, suggesting more extreme futures for our planet and um, some kind of um, expressing very optimistic futures for our planet. But the S um, SP2 is the middle of the road basis. So that's what En-ROADS is based on. Um, I think those, those are most of the points I want to make. Oh, the last point I want to make about the simulator is that it's updated all the time. So that gives me confidence. When new information comes out, they get busy and they change it. And that gives me confidence that I'm, I'm relying on um, these scientists who take this quite seriously and, and really strive for accuracy. So let's now go to the fun part and get into En-ROADS. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to share my En-ROAD screen. And it disappeared. <laughs> oh, I know why. Excuse me for a minute, I have to... Um... Can you see it now? No. All right, I will... Gotta love modern technology. Man, and we even practiced and everything. Okay. It happens. Here we go. Okay. When you when you put En-ROADS into your browser, or if you click on the link that Gretchen's gonna give you in the chat, this is what will pop up. And you'll simply, you can read this if you want, but you just simply close that. And you now what we're now doing is looking at the simulator. And I'd like to just draw your attention to the basic parts of the simulator. At the top, there are two charts. The global sources of primary energy, that graph is on the left-hand side. And on the right, greenhouse gas net emissions. And on the far right, the projected increase in temperature over pre-industrial levels if we do nothing. The baseline, this is the baseline scenario. If nothing much is done, our coal is gonna steadily increase, so is the oil in red, so is the blue in natural gas, so is the um, renewable energy, uh, which is increasing at a faster rate than any of the other energy sources, which is a good thing. But, but even though renewable energy is increasing fairly uh, steadily, we're continuing to throw um, our, our greenhouse gases into the air with the fossil fuels, if we do nothing. So that's the top of the screen. Then at the bottom of the screen, you see all these little black dots and there are 18 levers. On the left is the energy supply group of levers, which you can change to impact policy. So let's suppose that, um, that Gretchen decides that coal is a bad idea. Gretchen lives on a river that empties into the Mississippi. She knows that coal ash in the Mississippi River is an environmental problem and she thinks coal is has had its day and should be discouraged, perhaps heavily taxed. So I moved my lever to the left to discourage the use of coal. And notice what happened in the chart on the left. And notice what happened in the expected increase in greenhouse gas emissions, they dropped. And notice that the expected increase in temperature dropped by 0.2 degrees centigrade. If you go to this button at the very top right here, you can replay that change for yourself or anybody you're talking to. Let's hit it. And as I hit it, watch your two charts at the top of the page. It replays the last change that you made. So you can demonstrate the impact of policies that you're making on the environment. Okay. So, so that says that uh, by he heavily taxing coal, 
we've only reduced the centigrade temperature by two tenths. If I watched that, it was 3.6. That's correct. Two tenths and of a degree. Three tenths. Right. Okay. So let's say we want to know more about the details of things we're looking at. You can go to the three dots on the right hand side of one of your levers. And again, we've got energy supply levers here other levers to the right of it, but let's go to those three dots, those vertical dots, and you get a pop-up screen that gives you more details and more options. You can decide um, exactly what the price is gonna be on your coal tax and put the number in here. You can decide when you wanna start that tax. Let's decide we don't wanna shock our economy. We wanna ease into it. So let's move this lever over and not start that tax for a while. You can see the impact in our charts by the delay in the tax. We don't get the, the, the decrease in coal use for really quite a number of years, not until we start uh, taxing it. And you can see and this coal primary energy demand chart that the demand's not gonna drop off until the tax begins. You can use this lever to go down and decide when you're gonna stop either a tax or a subsidy. You don't have to tax coal, you could subsidize coal. That's why inroads is so nice. It doesn't take a side, it just shows you the effect of different things you do. Um, you can decide um, all these other details in each one of these levers. You can also get a lot more information if you hit this little eye. See this eye right here? Hit that. And you can get some examples of different ideas about this policy. You can get the overall big message, discouraging coal is a high leverage strategy for reducing um, future temperature change. Um, you can get the key dynamics of how it works and you can get some coal, the coal benefits illustrated. You know, coal emits these fine particulate matter into the air and it creates a lot of health problems across our country. And there's concrete evidence that will save lives if we decrease our coal production. And then this is one of my favorite parts of En-ROADS, the equity considerations, because it's not blind to the fact that policy changes have real impacts on people. And so what about those coal miners? Um, what about low-income communities? The equity considerations can um, bring up other issues about, about policy changes that you wanna make. So we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna run out of time this evening. You would all just die of boredom if I went into every little detail about every lever, but that's the overview of how this works. At this top, you can look at lots of different graphs. We started with the default graphs, which are the global sources of primary energy and the greenhouse gas net emissions. But there are many, many other graphs. So. Let's take away our, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quickly reset things uh, um, and then just, just tax coal because um, I, I wanna keep it a little simpler not have the delayed start of the tax. So returning to that scenario where we've taxed coal, let's look at what happens to the financial impact of that and the cost of energy, whoops. So let's go to cost of energy. So we're gonna see a bump in the cost of energy initially as we heavily tax one of our primary energy sources, that would be expected. So I think you know, that graph is always important to show. I always show the cost of energy uh, bump up when I'm talking about policy solutions because I think it's fair. It's fair uh, to show that there's gonna be some pain involved as we solve climate problems. And it's also very important, I think, because if we don't show that there's going to be higher prices in our energy system, we're going to really suffer serious, terrible backlashes. And there probably will be a backlash anyway, a protest. But at least if, if many people are educated to understand what must be done and the price of doing that, two things could happen. One is they may be more willing to accept the price of what has to happen. And secondly, we may develop policies that will help cushion those impacts. Perhaps, um, perhaps 
some uh, dividends uh, for um, for carbon pricing, for example, or for some kind of cash payment for the most vulnerable in our communities to help them weather these changes. Okay, so that that's a. I'm going to go back again to the default graphs um, and ask you all. So we're starting at the baseline scenario. I went through a few things just to show you the way En-ROAD works. But I really would like to hear from you because I saw from my readings that the League of Women Voters is environmentally very active. And you already know a lot of stuff that's in these 18 letters, levers about things we all can do to make our planet safer in the future. So among these choices, what are your ideas about, or, or outside these choices, we can talk about that too. What are your ideas about how we can help our planet? Uh, Jackie, my first thing may not be what you're expecting, but <clears throat> um, I'm looking over here and one of the things that's happening pretty seriously in Iowa and overlapping into Illinois right now is these proposals of pipelines to move carbon and sequester it either in Illinois or South Dakota from our ethanol plants and from our fertilizer plants. Is there a place on this graph that shows what that kind of supposed um, effort uh, will actually do. I mean, some of us are skeptical about the real trade-offs there. Right here on the right-hand side under carbon removal technological, if you hit three dots, mm -hmm. um, Mary Ellen, you'll pull up this chart, which shows different kinds of ways of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. This is where we'll find a lot of ideas that are relevant to the Midwest, where we um, most of us uh, live. And um, one of them is um bioenergy carbon capture and storage um okay. x and one is agricultural carb soil carbon sequestration many of you may have heard about um cover crops and how that's okay. helpful to pull carbon out of the air so all of these initiatives to pull carbon out of the air are in this technological carbon removal section um, on the Iowa issue, I don't know that you're, any of you are all interested in my personal point of view. Enroads doesn't take a point of view. It just says this is one tool and you can use carbon uh, capture and storage to take carbon out of the air. Um, most environmental groups that I'm a, a part of are opposed to the pipelines in Iowa. Um, I attended the uh, public hearings that Summit had in North Iowa about their pipelines, I specifically asked the Summit representative if they were uh, planning to take the carbon stored in another state out one day in the future to use for fracking, which is one of the concerns that people discussed about those pipelines. Mm -hmm. And his response was a measured response, which makes me as a former attorney extremely concerned. He said, at this time, we don't have those plans. <laughs> yeah, so That's not reassuring to me. So I, I, I'm sitting, I, I don't have a strong position on the pipeline because anything that takes carbon out of the atmosphere, I'm excited about. I understand and I'm sensitive to the argument that we should stop throwing it up in the atmosphere. That's the solution, not, not keep throwing it up and then taking it out. Um, but my, my thinking on this is that there are long-term solutions, which are to, to, to turn away from fossil fuel for our energy sources and towards renewable energy sources. And there are short-term solutions, um, like maybe these pipelines, which might take some of the carbon out while we're using biofuels in, um, to help support our farmers first and, uh, and also to take some carbon out of the atmosphere by reducing gasoline usage and supplementing it with ethanol. That's, you know, I think that, that it's a hot issue. I don't really have a strong position on it, but I'm aware that most environmentalists are pretty opposed. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's where you'll find it, right here in carbon removal technological. So let's, let's do that. Let's use all the sources, mineralization, which is sprinkling the salt on the ground and it pulls carbon out and carbon um, capture and storage and cover crops and the whole shebang, we'll use it all. 
and you've reduced the expected increase by 0.4 degrees centigrade, which is a good thing. So let's get some more ideas out there. Who else has a favorite personal solution to climate change? You know, I have a, I have a question for you, Jackie, uh, going back a little bit, and maybe I missed this at the beginning. So this, this is tool, uh, did you go through a training with them to present this? Did you have to be vetted in any way or just anybody who wants to be trained? Um, and then uh, was there a cost to it? Uh, I'd like to know a little more about this. I'm glad you asked, Rosemary. I certainly wasn't vetted. Um, everybody can do this. It's free. It's online. I, I took an online Mastering En-ROADS um, course last summer, but the training videos are all online all the time for everybody to do. So if you were excited about this and you wanted to know more about it, you could jump on and train yourself um, and just go through all the videos. It's, it's really easy to do. You can become, have a little program, you can become a climate ambassador. They'll send you a little certificate after you do presentations. It's, um, it's a fun thing. It, it, but anyway, it's very accessible. And when you go through the in-depth training, they, they spend hours and hours, of course, showing lots and lots of subtle impacts of En-ROADS that we won't have time for today, but um, it's accessible to everyone. You just jump online and go to um, play around with their, um, their website a little bit. You'll find the training fairly easily. They're really good at training. Thank you. You're welcome. So before well, I ask- we look at methane? Methane, methane is okay. much a bigger issue in, than carbon dioxide in terms of its impact. It, methane uh, does have a devastating impact because it lasts long. Uh, methane is right here. And um, if we, you know, methane, of course, is eating uh, beef a lot. Beef is the biggest problem, but then lamb and, um, and poultry and um, swine also contribute, as do rice fields, as do leaking landfills. You guys know all that. So let's, let's take some measures to significantly reduce methane. That has a really big impact. Um, well, one, one you missed is the amount that comes actually from uh, releases from uh, coal. I don't know coal so much, but certainly oil. Leaking, leaking natural gas yeah, and, right. um, and, and oil wells that have not been properly plugged. That's true. And there's some legislation right now in Congress working to uh, put a lid on some of those particular kinds of emissions of methane. It'll make a big difference, as you can see, 2.7 degrees centigrade expected increase over pre-industrial levels. Now, you all remember that we're, we're striving for less than 1.5 degrees increase. But um, you have that on top of technological. Why? You still have your technological high. Oh, yes, right? yes, yes. It's, 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 so I haven't taken that away, but, but I was hoping to, I can take that away to show you what the impact is by itself. It's 0.5 degrees. So together, but this is a cumulative effect and that's really the main point of En-ROADS. There's not a silver, silver bullet, it, there's silver buckshot. We need a lot of solutions. We've, we've together not saved our planet yet. We need to get this number down below 1.5. So we need more ideas. Renewables. Okay, let's subsidize them, shall we? And move this lever here. Now I'm going to replay that change and look at the, the difference it made was 0.2 degrees centigrade, which is good. Um, not as dramatic as, as we would like. Look at the chart on the left. We're still increasing our coal, our oil, and our natural gas use. So even, even making this uh, increase in renewables steeper than business as usual doesn't have as big an impact as we would hope because we're still heavily invested here. What's another good idea? Jackie, I had a question about hydrogen. Um, yes, Lee. Everybody's plugging hydrogen and I, and by the way, I have to congratulate you on your En-ROADS expertise. It's excellent presentation. I've sat through several. 
but I'm puzzled still about hydrogen because there are different ways of producing it. I can't, I can't figure out whether it's a hollow promise or a real promise. It, and Enroe shed anything on that? I don't know. I'm sorry, Lee, I don't have an answer for you. I, the, the, the solution for our need for a new source of uh, low emission energy that I've heard most about, the most exciting thing is this new nuclear fission development in Massachusetts. Um, but I really don't know, and, and it's, it's extremely new. Um, so I don't, I really don't know. I don't have an answer, I'm sorry. And yeah, I, don't, I, I don't either, that's why, <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm, I was impressed that Saudi Arabia's solution is to use their fossil fuels to generate hydrogen and then capture the carbon that's produced in the process and sell the hydrogen. And I have no idea if that's realistic and if it is what the impact would be on the climate. I don't either. I haven't read about it, but I'd be very, if you learn anything about it, I'd be really interested in knowing about it. Yeah, I've, I, I've told you all I know. <laughs> <laughs> How about all the energy that we waste? Who's got, who, who lives in an old, an old house that leaks and is not very tight? I do. So what if we stopped wasting the energy that we do use and we made it much more efficient? This one surprised me at how effective just not wasting what we're using. Um, that has a big impact, low hanging fruit, which is why energy districts and efforts to audit homes and help people insulate can make a real big difference in terms of our planet. So let's leave that there. We're down to 2.2. What else could we do? I'm interested in a, um, afforestation and see what that impact is. I love planting trees too. So let's plant a lot of them. We're down to 2.1. Um, that, that, you know, some of these don't, some of these changes disappoint folks because it doesn't make as much of an impact as they would like. Like my, my vegetarian friends are always disappointed not to see a bigger impact on the reduction of um, methane from not eating as much meat. But um, again, it, there isn't one solution. We really all need to do a lot of different things. Um, can, how about, can, we couple the, can we couple the afforestation with the uh, lowering deforestation? What do is that? that? Stop cutting down so many of our trees. And we've made it a lot better. We're now at two degrees, which was the, you know, the Paris Accords were looking at two degrees, but more recent information has suggested we need to be more aggressive than that. So let's try to get it lower. Does well, anybody drive, anybody drive an electric car? I have a hybrid. Hybrid. Good for you guys. I read that um, in the UK last year, they dramatically reduced their auto emissions of CO2 because of a significant increase in the number of electric and hybrid cars that they drive. So let's electrify our transportation. Whoa, big impact because of course, as you guys know, you've heard this, transportation is a, a major uh, part of our emissions problems. Um, is this for the whole world? Because in watching the Olympics uh, this week, one of the commentators mentioned that the one child policy of China has resulted in such an imbalance of males over females that there aren't enough families being formed to have children. And China has reversed and asked people to have three children now. So population is likely to go up if this is a worldwide model. It is a worldwide mo model. Um... Climate Interactive has something called Sea Roads, which is uh, not worldwide, but the planet is, a, to me, the only interesting way to think about climate changes from a planetary standpoint, because we're all so connected. One of the interesting things you can look at, in addition to the many graphs under the graphs um, little down arrow, you can go to view and look at the Kaya graphs here. And this 
this um, brings up the population. I want to address that. So I, I want to answer your question because it has a lot of layers. First of all, it is a global portrait and po the population increase has a big impact on um, climate change because more people means more need for energy and more energy means more emissions. So it's a big driver. Pyographs mean global population times the GDP per capita, and that's a global um, number, times the energy intensity of the, the GDP times the carbon intensity of the final energy will result in the CO2 emissions from the energy. So these pyographs are reflecting the changes we've made thus far to our future scenario that we're designing. And in, in China, um, they're, build, they're, they're still building new coal plants, which is yeah. uh, troubling because coal is such an extremely uh, strong emitter of pollutions. What are the other ideas that you can see down here? We're down to 1.8, we're actually almost there, but there's a pretty powerful solution that some of you have, some of you know about, how can we discourage the use of fossil fuels? Electrification of building and industry. That's a good idea. Let me go back to my other graphs here. And electrify buildings and industry. You've really dropped it down now. Oh, yeah. You guys have done extremely well. And let's make our transportation, even if we're not driving an electric car, energy efficiency is an interesting tool. This, mean, this includes things like, gee, maybe I could walk to the library instead of drive. Gee, maybe I could take the train if I live in an urban area and not take my car. And, or it, maybe it means I buy a more efficient gas car than the one I have. So we can make our transportation more efficient with some of those ideas and we can, and we can save our planet. I have a That's comment I wanna make about going back to the energy supply. I'm kind of troubled by the fact that it says renewables are highly subsidized, but it doesn't say that about coal, oil, and natural gas, which that's a that's a choice we just made. Let's let's decide not to make that choice and not do anything with our renewable energy. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. All right, okay. yeah. And then if you so if I I could tax renewables and put it over there, so you can do whatever you know. It doesn't take the side; it just gives you options, to okay. try out ideas. Okay. So, one of the interesting things about this group is you've got you're very sophisticated and you know a lot about how population drives climate change, economic growth drives climate change. Um, and you've got all these good solutions, which are very ambitious, by the way, it would be hard to get all of these things done. But if we did, it would make a big difference. But let's go back to our business as usual scenario and look at just one solution that would discourage fossil fuel use. I have friends who say carbon pricing is the key, the CCL folks. Does that do anything? Well, I'm a CCL person and I love this lever. Look at this. You move carbon price and you get your, you make a, a big impact on the planet. That one thing alone. Look how we've stopped throwing CO2, as much CO2 up into the atmosphere, a real sharp decrease with a big carbon price. And if you couple that with a dividend to cushion the impact of the, let's show it, to be honest, increase in cost of energy. Look at that big spike. That's the, that is the, the elephant in the room that we have to acknowledge and look at if we're considering a carbon price. You all know that carbon pricing policies mean that you put a price on the amount of carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere from a, a company's product, like a coal company or an oil company. It's different than taxing those companies. Let's show the difference. I think that's really interesting. Instead of a carbon price, let's say, well, wouldn't, couldn't you also decrease coal and oil and natural gas by taxing them all heavily? Yes, you would, you would also have that spike in costs, but look at the lower impact on the planet. 
you have just lowered the expected increase in temperature to 3.1 degrees centigrade from 3.6, which is not nearly the impact of a carbon price. Let's, let's return to our basic policies and look at carbon price again. So why the difference? I found this one of the most, I don't know if you did too, Linda, but one of the most interesting things about the, the inroads training, because I first thought, well, wouldn't it be kind of the same, a heavy tax on the fossil fuel companies versus a carbon price on the carbon they're emitting? But the difference they've explained to me, and they've got, they've got 45,000 algorithms in inroads, and they've just got lots of little nuances in their policies. And Apparently, a carbon price is a more efficient way to improve our um, warming planet because it encourages innovation. If you price carbon, then, then the oil company and the coal company is going to say, well, wait a minute, I can do better. I don't want to pay that much money. I want to pay less money. So I'm going to make sure my coal doesn't emit as much carbon because I'm going to figure out how to scrub it out. So it encourages this innovation and that factor is reflected in the much bigger impact benefiting our planet. Isn't that fun? And could I point out that if you remit the um, carbon costs that you uh, fees, uh, refund them to people on the average, then that increase that you're showing in your upper left graph uh, will not affect people as much or at all. Exactly. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby is pretty sensitive to that and so am I. We, we, what the argument is for some of the, there are different policies about pricing carbon. One policy was designed so that this kind of an, uh, policy, a carbon price, would not affect lower or middle income people much. Um, if you are a jet setter, if you fly to Paris for a ham sandwich, if you have five cars, it's going to, that little dividend that's paid to you is not going to offset your increased energy costs. And so you'll just have to pay a lot more. But if you are an average um, Dane out there, you are, you're, you're, you're going to get a dividend paid to you that will help you absorb these increased costs. Thank you for pointing that out. So the carbon price alone, it's my favorite solution because it's got such a big bang. But your other ideas, you guys, are um, important parts of the picture, electrifying our, our grid. Now, and they're not without problems. Each of them, you know, again, I think it's so important to be humble with these presentations and honest because each of these solutions has, has problems and complexities. So for an example, I drive a Tesla. And I love this car, it's so much fun, it's so interesting, but I understand that the mining required to bring up the minerals to make those batteries is a big problem. And that's all reflective when you go to that eye and you bring up um, the uh, equities involved, it'll, it'll talk about all those issues. So I think we all need to be, what I like to think about is just get more information all the time so we can better understand all the impacts and then try to encourage ref real good reflection about solutions that are going to benefit all of us because there's not just one fix. 1.1 degrees centigrade, oh my gosh, you guys, we're going to have a good world. Do you have Jackie, more questions? Yeah. I may be one of the few people, but I... I have always felt that our fear of nuclear energy is unfounded. Um, and so I'm curious about what effect if we increased our use of nuclear energy would have on this map. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, and one I'd like to talk about, I'm gonna go back to basic graphs and reset all the policies and just look at that one so you can see its impact. Let's subsidize nuclear. It's it's not gonna have a huge impact, Mary Ellen. And um, one of the things about nuclear that, that makes it difficult is that it costs a lot of money and it takes a long time to build that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to quickly reduce your fossil fuels use. You can decide that nuclear is a good option because 
um, if you can figure out how to handle the waste, it doesn't emit greenhouse gases. And so it's um, a, a possible solution to our global warming. But it's a piece that has to come into play, long, that, that will come into play long term. And in the meantime, if we keep throwing up the greenhouse gas emissions, we're doomed. We have to quickly decrease these Those, three yeah. emitters. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, do they have something about how much carbon the for the uh, fires are putting into the air? You know, we have these uh, positive feedback loops. Um, you guys are probably familiar with that phrase. Positive doesn't mean it's a good thing. It, what it means is it's reinforcing things. And so our wildfires are caused by the warming planet, which has created warm conditions, which then creates the, um, the wildfires, which then heat up the earth more with more emissions. And then we have this positive feedback loop worsening the climate change scenario, which is, which is why they talk about a tipping point, because if things get bad enough, we can't recover. We've just, we've gotten, we've gotten too far over the line. I'm still optimistic um, about our ability as, as mankind to solve climate change. Um, and I think En-ROADS helps that. When you, can, when you sit here and move these levers and learn more and more about all the details, it gives you a feeling of optimism, like there's things that we can do. Um, we can advocate for these changes. And if you look at other countries, they're there. You know, Canada's got a carbon price. We, other places in the world are ahead of the United States in terms of their active involvement to solve climate change. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's really, really enlightening. Um, I guess at this point, I'm, I'm curious about whether there's a way to take all of this information and to tie it to legislation. Um, let's say there was a suggestion to increase, uh, the place a carbon tax of X percent on some particular industry. Is there any way that we could use this to gauge the effectiveness in terms of how much would that um, improve the environment? What would be the financial cost on people? Is there something that translates this from a very interesting scenario to uh, practically gauging what potential legislation might do? Um. Yes and no. There's not a direct way, but there's an indirect way, John, if I understand your question correctly. En-ROADS, this presentation, this exact type of presentation has been used with many members of Congress. I have talked to Congress about this. I've sat in sessions with my members of Congress and I've showed them En-ROADS and explained the, these policies to their staff and to them. And um, in that sense, it's used to try to persuade them to do something that will make a big difference. And so that's why um, I think carbon pricing is now very much at play because a, another um, advocacy group of the Citizens Climate Lobby does exactly that. They argue for this carbon pricing solution with a, with a dividend. And so they've drafted, there is legislation that has been drafted, it's been introduced, it's, it's their particular favorite piece of legislation has 82 co-sponsors. So it's um, definitely a vehicle to persuade policymakers to enact legislation that will improve the planet. So for an example, if you weren't too interested in, in the carbon pricing solution that Citizens Climate Lobby likes, maybe you just would really like to stop the use of coal in our country. You could, you could, um, you could use this tool to draft legislation, you could hit your three dots and figure out exactly what the, um, how much the tax should be. And you could then go to your member of Congress and um, discuss that impact with them and um, argue that legislation should be enacted to place a $91 um, per TCE tax on carbon. So it could be, it, it's a tool that can be used to draft legislation but it's not a tool that directly translates into legislation. Did that answer your question? Um, partly, I guess I'm wondering, is it something that could be used? Let's say there's a, a, a 
a draft bill. Is this the kind of a tool that someone not in Congress could look at that draft bill and say, oh, here's the impact that that's going to have as a way to determine whether or not that that bill or proposed legislation should be supported or opposed? Yes, yes. The Carbon Fee and Dividend Act proposed in Congress can you can look at the details of it and you can take those details and put it into this and roads program and show the impact it would have but i don't know that i mean it just depends on what the legislation is if if there's legislation to reduce the use of plastics which is a good thing because uh, plastics of course are created uh, with oil which is a fossil fuel but this program doesn't show you can't take that legislation to reduce the use of plastics and use En-ROADS to show the impact. So it has, it will show the impacts of some legislation um, that's environmentally related, but not all legislation. Okay, thank you. Do you guys have other questions? Well, I'm just curious. So let's say you're taking this to a congressman or a group of Congress people. And I, if I were one of them, I would be wondering, okay, so is there a simple way to see what some of this is based on in terms of the, uh, you know, what percentage of renewables we have now or how much coal? I'm not sure exactly what things you would need, but it seems like some people would have a hard time just relating to this without having some sense of where some of the, the the background came, let's say, for for developing this. Um, the answer is yes, and I was I, I wanted to use your your example of renewables, which I, um, to see if I could find it quickly. So, if you go to your that little eye and you scroll down, they give you studies. So you can go to their sources of information right here. So mm -hmm. what I did was I hit the three vertical dots, then I hit this little I, and then I scrolled down to find the footnotes that are the basis for the information mm -hmm. in this okay. section. Um, and in addition, there's a 400 page user guide online, again, free, we can all look it up. And so when you have a, a detailed question about something, you can, and it's, it's, it's got a nice index. It's not that hard, hard to deal with. I have not read the 400 page guide, but I, but I look up stuff in it all the time. Like for an example, I saw um, an En-ROADS slide that uh, predicted that there would be like a large, like hundreds of thousands of deaths could be avoided if we got rid of um, coal. And I thought, I don't know. Is that's kind of a stretch? Is that true? So I, who says so? So I looked it up, and it was I'm making up names because I don't remember them. But I looked it up, and it said, "Oh, you know, Ms. Ms. Schwartz and uh, Mr. Smith said so." So I said, "Well, who are they?" And so then I looked them up, and then like they had three PhDs, and they worked for NASA, and I thought, okay. You convinced me, you know, you can really chase it down. Um, and that's what I really love about this program. You can chase it down because so much of the information that we get, we're just flooded with, with information that is often not based on anything. And the basis for En-ROADS is there for you to look up. Um, so again, I trust it. Jackie, uh, Ralph has his hand up. Ralph, uh, unmute yourself. Sorry, Ralph. Yes, uh, very interesting. But now my understanding, this is a global model, um, but is there a way of tweaking this so that you could say, what if we in the United States do you know, electrify and, and put a price on carbon and, and, and reduce methane and do these other things, what effect we would have on it as opposed to Assuming that everybody else is going to be doing the same thing, which seems to be what you're saying in the model, right? If it's a global model. Um, um, the answer to your first question is not that I know of. I don't think we can single out the United States to show the impact of our country alone. Um, but, but I think the idea behind 
big policies in the United States is that we can then make an impact on the rest of the world. For an example, that carbon pricing that is so effective, it's coming in Europe and they're gonna have a border adjustment and we're gonna be in trouble if we don't have a carbon price. Specifically, what I mean by that is the legislation that's now before Congress, this Carbon Fee and Dividend Act, proposes a border adjustment. You know about this already? It, it proposes a border adjustment. And so that if a country doesn't have a carbon price, they're mm -hmm. gonna get slapped with a tariff if they try to sell their product into the United States and try to compete with our industry that is subject to a carbon um, price. So um, it's a, a lot of these policies, when they're, if they're adopted by large countries will have a big influence on the rest of the world doing the same thing. So in answer to the second part of your, your comments, yes, maybe these policies would just be the United States, but when we're big and we're powerful and if we enact a lot of these, these solutions, we can influence the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, there's a note in the chat, Jackie, from Lee Morgan, that there are other models that show only the US and that they are used by Congress. Um, yes. I don't um, know that, I don't know that it helps to try to solve the climate problem with a single country's initiatives, because uh, if China's building coal plants, um, we're just not gonna make a lot of difference unless we enact complex policies that influence their choices. Other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Um, I wanted to back up here a bit though. Um, Kay mentioned a book by Kim Stanley Robinson called Ministry for the Future that uses many of these strategies and shows their effects. So might wanna, if you're interested in more, that might be something to look into. Uh, Jackie, I'm curious about your optimism. I call myself a pragmatic optimist, but I have to confess that Sometimes when I look at the challenge that climate change is giving us, has, that's in front of us right now globally, uh, I, I have to sometimes ask myself, how can I still be optimistic? I think the Yale climate studies can give you some optimism because they reflect the fact that most people are pretty concerned. So that gives me a boost in my optimism because solutions start with concern. Um, I'm also optimistic because I think that we're awfully smart and that people from, from grassroots efforts to major corporations are getting very interested in solutions to climate change. Um, when, when major conservative groups like, you know, or, or, or publications like the Wall Street Journal print a lot of climate crisis information steadily. It's persuasive to me that solutions around the corner because, because the people that are getting concerned are really smart and really rich. And um, that's a combination that can affect change. I just want to make a, a comment there. I'm a chemist. I get a publication called Chemical and Engineering News. And uh, two weeks ago, I think it was in their issue, okay. the headline was uh, the chemical outlook for 2022. So? And I thought, oh, what's it gonna happen? So when I spent time looking at all the things that were profiled as part of the outlook for 2022, there were 14 different uh, articles. And of those nine, were related to environmental issues. I would not have expect, ex, expected that when I saw the heading on the cover. And so it kind of goes along with what you're saying about people, smart people working in areas that are working to make change and turn things around. And so that helps me, I guess, to have a little bit of hope. And they're getting so sophisticated, Donna, that you think that the article that I read in the, in the journal this morning talked about how some of the integrated assessment models are not 
as accurate as they had hoped because they're realizing that clouds have this really oh. complex impact on the climate because they both hold down greenhouse gases and reflect um, heat. And so they haven't tweaked the um, algorithms perfectly to reflect exactly what's going to happen in the future. And that just encourages me because they're always re-examining. They're always re-looking at this. And I think there's a lot of good people working hard on solutions. Even Rotary has gotten more interested in uh, encouraging its members to look for environmental issues and, and, and solutions. They have. I'm glad you mentioned them, Rosemary, because they are um, my favorite group to present to because they tend to be climate doubters. So it's fun to, you know, why talk to people who have the same concerns I do? It's, not, you know, they're not as, um, it's not as interesting and important to me. I, I really like to talk to people who um, just challenge me and, and, um, and I, the Rotary groups are wonderful. They added a seventh area of focus, as you just um, implied. Their seventh area of focus is the environment. So they, they have meetings every week. They're ripe for speakers. And so I can call up a local Rotary and they are almost always willing to have me come speak. And I think most of my, I, don't, I haven't really added all the numbers, but probably most of my talks have been to Rotary groups. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a really avid audience. That's good to know, because they're mostly white males. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about the influence. You mentioned that this is always kind of being tweaked and adjusted. Um, we're hearing an awful lot about the thaw at the polar ice cap and the thaw of the permafrost and uh, the dramatic uh, pictures and videos we're seeing of icebergs calving and falling in. Um, how does this model uh, ad adjust for those kinds of rapid changes that are going on? I mean, so some of them are going to negate our ability to lower this number. I mean, um, it's like they're going to they're going to counterbalance some of our work. Um, I think those are part of their, I'm pretty sure that that's part of the algorithms. Um, and as they discover, that's why they're updating, as they discover significantly more um, impacts on the polls, they incorporate that information into the algorithm and adjust all the results of what we're doing. So it, it does have an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I'm a pragmatist too, Mary Ellen, and that's why I'm an optimist because there's no other practical way to respond to this horrific projection. To do nothing is not an option. Mm -hmm. And to despair is not an option. To me, the only pragmatic option is to be optimistic and do our best and try the solutions that we can discover. Uh, let's uh, hear from people who haven't had a chance to uh, respond or ask questions. Sean is one of our board members. Are you out there, Sean? I am. I what? just, I, I am here, but I despair. I just have trouble with the concept that people are going to change. There's an old adage, Sean, that people don't change. And I think it is so true, just as, as you've said, but maybe what we need is for policies to change and not necessarily people people will always care about their children and their grandchildren and future gener and most people will care about future generations. And that care that I think won't change will eventually lead to solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, the, um, in the training that Jackie and I did, there is a part of it where we are asked to realize that we are at a moment of choice right now. That this, this actually is an option we have and that we should spend a minute, just a minute thinking about what the world would be like 
if we were able to make the kinds of changes that Jackie was showing us, we can make, that these are possible, these can be done. How would the world look if we made the changes? And how would we feel about it? How would, we, how would our feelings about the future change if we really believed that this was something we could all have a role in doing? Thank you, Linda, that's, that's so true. Uh, one of the things I might ask everyone is, um, if you're willing to share, what kinds of behaviors um, are you changing or have you changed now that we have this awareness? Um, and I'll, I'll just say that um, I'm approaching 80 and I am planting trees. Um, every year I plant more trees. Now, a lot of them are uh, food trees. I'm planting fruit and nut trees. Uh, so they serve a dual purpose. They're going to feed people, uh, but they're also going to be carbon sinks. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that Jackie and I share a passion over native prairies because they're carbon sinks, permanent roots in the ground. But what are other little pieces that uh, people are doing that they can hold up and say, this is my little contribution? Because one of the things I saw was in this simulator, Jackie, was um, it does take multiple different practices. There's not one magic bullet out there. Somebody said they had a hybrid. Okay. What other examples do we have in this small group? Composting, Catherine says. Composting, closing off rooms, don't use. Okay. Well, I think to look for programs that your utility may have that would help uh, if you if you want to upgrade things or I'm in Minnesota. So here we have the possibility of uh, oh, I'm forgetting what it is, but it's a program you can sign on. And so if the energy if in the summer when it's really hot oh save or switch. Uh, so when it's really hot, then you might not get as much energy as somebody else. And therefore, it means that they don't have to be prepared for this peak. And uh, that's one way to uh, have an impact. And right now, we're also trying to get people, I actually live in Roseville, Minnesota. So we have a program with Excel. And uh, one of the goals is to get more people signed up for choosing wind as their source of their electricity. So I think checking with what is possible with your utilities is one, I'll just say it's kind of a generic thing because it would be different depending on your utility. Then, then yeah. that's such an important idea, Donna, because as we saw in En-ROADS, that has a huge impact, not wasting energy. If we can contact our utilities, find out how we can be more efficient, all the different ways we can um, just cut down on our use of energy it makes a big difference. I mean, I have to say one of the surprises in all of the things you did tonight was there's a lot of competition that feels like if we just get solar panels and we get wind turbines, uh, that's gonna be our solution. And because it's more groovy, I guess, in a way, than focusing on what do I need to do to uh, add insulation or change my windows so that they're efficient or whatever. So what the arrow showed with the energy efficiency and what that could do was a really big wow, I thought. Other thoughts? Um, what, what are you doing locally? Who haven't we heard from? Kent, I don't know where you're from. Hi folks, I've been... Uh you know, the fly in the wall here from Michigan for the last hour or so. So first of all, Jackie, great job. Um, I went through the En-ROADS training last year um, and wanted to just kind of observe because I now really want to do some of my own presentations. So great job. Um, you know, I, I do a few things here in terms of our city. Uh, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so I live in a very liberal bubble. Um, we have a very aggressive uh, 
um, you know, net zero carbon emission plan that we're putting together by that we're going to enact by 2030. Um, for us, there's a great number of opportunities to kind of volunteer. Um, one of the things I've been doing, we've just passed some regulations in our city uh, whereby all the businesses are going to be required to submit their energy usage to the city uh, so that the city can help them, you know, get that under wraps and get control of their energy expenditures. So uh, they've been training a number of us in the use of what is called Energy Star, which is kind of a, almost like a taxation program that people can use to um, really get a better idea of the kind of energy they're spending. And so we'll act as representatives to kind of help them through that process. But there are so many things you do, you can do. I know that here uh, we're kind of fortunate. We have uh, Washtenaw County, we have the city of Ann Arbor, uh, Governor Whitmer has just put a, a climate action plan here by 2050. So uh, there's going to be a lot of, I think, opportunities and more of a, um, a requirement where cities, towns, counties are going to have to kind of be starting to pay attention to their climate footprint. And that's going to force people to really have to rethink the way they're, they're doing things. Uh, planting trees, all the ideas that you guys have come up with are great. Uh, rain gardens, things like that are really fun and, and great ways to do it. Um, I, did, I had a question, um, Jack, you said you did a lot of um, presentations to rotary, rotary groups. When you talk to those groups, what did, what's the most common pushback that you, you get from folks? What's the most common misconception? I'm in Iowa and mm -hmm. Iowans are infamously polite. So yeah. they don't throw tomatoes or anything exciting like that. Um, and the, the truly, so I'll tell you a couple of examples. Um, often someone will say, well, I, I just don't think climate, I think this is all blown out of proportion. It's you know just exaggerated, it's not a real problem. And I'm, I always say, really, I'm, really interested in that. Um, and I'd like to know your source of information because if I'm incorrect, I, I, want, I want to know. I, I really like to have facts. So one time a gentleman got back to me eventually with a name and said, this, this expert says it's exaggerated and it's not true. So I said, thank you so much. I, I want to look into that. So then I looked into it and I got back to him and I said, well, did, you know, that was interesting, but did you know that this gentleman was formerly the coal lobbyist for the coal industry in Australia. And so that doesn't make him wrong, but it might bias his point of view and might make him you know, have less confidence in his opinions. And then there's no response. So I get that kind of exchange sometimes, but not usually. Usually the strongest doubters are silent, but one interesting uh, day at a Rotary meeting, I pulled up that cost of energy slide that I showed you all, because it's so important to be clear. So I'm, I'm bubbling along with my solutions and all these good things we're gonna do. And then I pop up that slide to show the spike in energy costs. And one person just went, ha! And it was like, it was like his, his gotcha moment, his idea that he, he discovered the, the hole in my whole idea. But uh, and I'm still working on that individual to try to get a dialogue going because the next response is, yes, it's true. There are these big costs, but what's your plan? What's your idea about what we're going to do? You know, let's work together. Uh, let's brainstorm. And if there's a way to do it without increasing energy costs, that would be great. Um, and I, I just think it's I, in answer really to... Um, Mary Ellen's query about what we're all doing, we can talk about it. We can talk about it with everybody and most importantly with the doubters. I think we can do so much just by getting it into the conversation. I, I, I think it's a huge contribution that we can all make talking about it. Jackie, yeah. I just want to follow up on that because there was a, there's a, a Dr. Hayhoe, some of you may have heard of her. 
And uh, I heard her talk uh, last week. She was talked here at the Westminster Town Hall Forum in Minneapolis. But in some of the stuff she used at the beginning was exactly what you started with. But the end, her ending takeaway is talk to people. Uh, figure out people that you do something with that doesn't necessarily have anything directly to do with the climate, but think about how you can bring issues about the climate into, let's say, if you, uh, maybe not inside sports, but suppose you go biking with a group or you go canoeing with a group. Just think about how you could say something that's kind of casual, but talk about it. Thank you, Donna. I did steal that line from Catherine Cahill. Cahill. Oh, she's, okay. <laughs> she really is. She's good, isn't she? Yes. Um, so I've, I've taken this to my elderly auntie in Tennessee and to my best friend from fifth grade in Illinois and to as well as to the larger church groups and rotary groups I take it everywhere with me and I show people stuff and and a few people are totally bored but most people you know just get them thinking about different impacts they can make and um I think it's useful uh, we're down to just about five minutes left so anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak up um this is your time i'm looking at um some of these people i don't know uh phyllis adams where are you phyllis is on mute okay marlene sanescu are you up to sharing? Okay, we got not really willing to share. I not as familiar with the topic as most of these people. Uh, okay, well, I hope you learned something. Uh, I definitely did. I've learned a lot from this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, glad to have you with us. Um, others, Linda Dolphin, I think, have you? spoken up here? Uh, no, uh, but I do have a comment. Um, I think when we're looking to purchase renewable energy, uh, such as solar panels, um, I watched a documentary and uh, they were saying that many of the panels are made by slave labor. Uh, for instance, the uh, Uyghurs, I believe it is in China, they pointed them out that they were forced to make those solar panels. So I'm just saying that a person needs to ask, where are we buying our materials? Excellent point, Linda, excellent point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes, and thank you for this program. It's been wonderful. We appreciate that. Okay, um, so going forward, we know that um, <clears throat> there are a couple presentations coming up in Illinois. And just to reiterate, there will be one uh, coming up in Iowa. Uh, Jackie will be repeating this program to the Iowa League. So you can go on the Des Moines Metro League if you're interested in seeing it again, or if you have friends who aren't with us tonight, uh, share those upcoming opportunities uh, to learn more about this simulator. Uh, it was, uh, I, I learned a lot more tonight uh, beyond our first experience, um, Jackie. So this was wonderful to see this play out. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, put my big screen up so I can see everybody. Uh, view. Going to that grid in the upper left. Well, yeah. you want to ask her, just do stop share, whoever's the host or. Okay, or I can stop share. Yeah, stop the share. Yeah, let's. Um, and then, you, then it gets that out of the way. There, there you go. There we go. So again, um, a wonderful experience, a lot to think about. And I think uh, what I'm encouraged about watching this, and the reason I provoked the question about how can you be optimistic is, uh, I think the one thing this experience teaches me that um, individually, it may not seem like we're doing big things, 
because we recycle or we're conscientious about our energy efficiency in our home or uh, our usage or whatever. But what I can see is that collectively, using this model collectively, we can have an impact. And that's what my takeaway is. Jackie, Lear, last thoughts, my dear. Well, you are an amazing group. It's really fun to talk to people who are as sophisticated and smart as you are. I'm sorry I didn't have all the answers. Um, but I would I put my email into the chat right at the beginning. And if you would email me any questions, you just want to brainstorm back and forth. I love to keep learning and I love to do research on things I don't know. So um, let me know if you want to continue the conversation and I'd be glad to do that. And also, as you might have seen in the last slide, if you know of a group that you think might like a presentation, let us know. I'm part of a group that's called 99 Counties for Climate Action. And we travel all over the place and um, give in-person presentations as well as Zoom presentations. I'm not the only one in that group that does it, but if you'd like to see one or um, again in a, another group that you have your church, your, um, your knitting group, your book club, whoever you want us to talk to. I talk to schools a lot. Um, I'd be glad to come. Thanks Excellent. again for having me. So, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. So thank you everyone for being with us. Watch the UMR website for upcoming programs. And also I'm told that the Illinois uh, League has a great calendar of their upcoming programs. Uh, each league in this upper Mississippi River region has a wonderful website. Lots of things going on. So if you're uh, a current league member, thank you for that. I'm reminding everyone, ask one, add one. Okay, so that's our goal in Iowa this year is uh, let's try and add another member. I made that invitation to Jackie at the start of this program tonight, invited her to be a league member because there's a new league forming in her area. So keep that in mind. Thank you all for being with us and thank you to our uh, admin, Gretchen Sable, for doing such a good job of hosting this meeting. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. Bye, thank you. Yeah.